Again. <laughs> Hello and welcome to a new session of uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Glamorous World. And today I'm joined here by Luke, Luke Stebbing, and uh, we'll be talking a little bit about what uh, Glamorous Toolkit and Moldable Development is. Um, hi, Luke. Hi. So nice to meet you. Um, we've uh, met uh, on the Discord channel of, uh, of Glamorous Toolkit, where we have all these exciting conversations. And um, we said, uh, let's, let's actually have a session and um, share or talk a little bit in deeper as, about the questions you might have uh, regarding Glamorous Toolkit and moldable development. But before we start, um, what is Glamorous Toolkit for you? Uh, I think for me, for a long time, I've just been interested in working in some kind of an environment where whenever I saw something and I thought, oh, that should work differently, uh, that I can actually make that change. And I can look at how the system works and I can play around with it and I can try experiments for uh, different ways that things can work. So just that kind of deep uh, programmability or moldability in the system is something that I've been looking for for a long time. Yeah, cool. Okay, <clears throat> so let's dive in. What would you like to know? Uh, well, I um, I guess I, I've got a couple a couple different things. Some of them um, kind of more more detailed questions, or like uh, um, what it would mean to have uh, full keyboard navigation in something like Glamorous Toolkit, like sort of a, a keyboards only mode. And obviously, there's a lot of things that aren't you know where that's that's a a substandard way to interact with uh, a GUI, but um, I'm interested in having things like that uh, where I can. Um, so that's that's sort of a, um, I, I think that that's kind of isolated from my other questions. Um, I'm interested in uh, document editing and things like that. Um, uh, let, let, me, let me think of a different way to approach that. Uh, there's this, uh, these old concepts that have been around uh, in computer science for a long time, like uh, Ted Nelson's Xanadu and just like various ways of doing hypertext and having very flexible ways to link information together. And I'd love to uh, have a system where I could be doing some of that, but a system that was moldable. So there's these things now like, um, you know, Zettel casting systems or things like Rome Research or whatever, but you kind of have to buy into that particular system and it works the way that it works. And I would really like something that has, you know, some of the key features that I would like from a system like that, like backlinks, um, ways to sort of build a personal wiki, but then to take it in my own directions and specialize it maybe in different ways, um, mixing in things that I think that uh, Glamorous Toolkit is very good at, like having special rendering for contacts and whatnot. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested in that sort of direction. I'm also interested in spaced repetition, like systems like uh, Anki or SuperMemo uh, and ways to integrate that more tightly into like a personal knowledge system saying like, oh, I have all of this wiki data and some of it I want to actually review on some spaced repetition schedule. And again, this is something where it's it's sort of, it's simpler if you can just say like, I can write a bit of extra code and understand this is a certain kind of, you know, add in that I can bring back and review. And it's a, but it's an interactive thing and review maybe means something interactive and testing whether I knew the, the exhibited the mental motion or whatever that I wanted to is an interactive thing. So there's this thing called execute program uh, by uh, Gary Bernhardt, the destroy all software um, screencasting guy. And so, uh, he, that is something sort of in, in that vein where you're, you can do interactive coding lessons in it. It actually, rather than just saying, oh yeah, I, I knew the, I knew the fact you, you write a bit of TypeScript or something and you show that you knew the fact. Um, so I'm interested in that, that sort of thing as well. And it seems to me that having that integrated in one environment, uh, like GT, uh, could be really valuable. Like just removing the friction of going between different systems for those sorts of things. Um, and then we could get into a little bit of, I've just got some questions about uh, performance, uh, about continuous uh, saving of images or of like uh, continuously journaling out actions that I perform in the system so I can go back and have history. Um, some stuff on the, um, the sort of computer science -y side of like, could I write uh, some programs in here and then maybe transpile them out? Could I? Um, could I write some code and may, maybe 
put in some optional static typing? Could I manage effects? So there's like many directions that we could go. Um, Instarepl ideas from like light table, you see, you know, that sort of thing back in the day and that crops up again and again. So there's a lot of stuff that I've just thrown out there. Um, mm -hmm. Could take it in any order or, or anything else that, uh, that you, you feel like would be to great, great to bring in. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in all of that. Well, that, that's, that, these are all fascinating. Um, so maybe we, we talk a little bit about the, the wiki part um, yeah. and, and bring, bring those documentation um, into this into the realm of Glamour's Toolkit and perhaps a little bit of perspective. Um, so we, we started Glamour's Toolkit specifically to solve the, the problem of, of code reading. Um, or to, to reimagine how code reading could look like, or actually how not reading code could look like mm -hmm. um, and still making much better decisions for it. Um, this, this, that, that has been the, the original uh, goal. And then, um, we, we, and then the, the whole idea of multiple development is this, that when, because code is basically data and it doesn't have, data doesn't have a shape, uh, it means that, but, me as a human to reason about data, I need a specific form. Um, and that form is provided by tools now, uh, but given that there is no intrinsic shape, for example, if I look at on the, you know, out the window, I, there is like the, the landscape presents itself in, in, a, in a default way uh, to me. Data doesn't have that and neither does code. And just because we're typing text, uh, that's not, uh, it's not necessarily uh, that's not the in intrinsic shape. It just happens to be the input shape. Um, and, but so, but the way I look at it, um, right? Um, even then it's, uh, I, it can dramatically influence how I think about it, how I think about the data. Um, and in fact, like it actually took a long time, you know, for, for people, if you think about the real world, it took a long time for people to, map or to create maps that were not representations of two or 3D uh, spaces, right? It took a long time until people put, okay, here's an X, here's a Y and here's an X mm. um, and, and plot this one on that 2D space where people would otherwise just draw maps. Um, <clears throat> and that's an interest, that was an interesting thing. And then since then we can actually reason about the earth, you know, about the physical space in ways that are distinct from how the, the physical space, you know, even the physical space presents itself. And that's quite interesting, right? And then, but with data, we don't have, we don't even have that problem. Um, so it's clear that the shape is, is a systematic or is an, is, is an essential part in software engineering. But until now we have treated it as an optional thing. And as a consequence, we, we end up um, having troubles with systems that we have already built. And that's not sustainable. And so that's basically where we started from. Now, it actually started from just, uh, you know, just looking at architecture, uh, you know, like this problem of how do you steer agile architecture? And, um, and, um, and then it turned out that there's no specific way to look at anything um, in, in software. And then you, you have to have multiple perspectives and there's, even when you are able to, you know, create, even when you think, oh, this is the interesting, this is the interesting perspective, you always find another problem that requires another perspective, which means now that uh, for code, there is no dominant decomposition of anything. And that there are always many, there are always many narratives that have to be accommodated. And that's basically the, the essence of, of Glamour's Toolkit. Uh, it's this idea that we need an environment where we need to formulate many different narratives. For example, in code, right, this, this idea of narratives is not new, right? So, for example, if you look at literate programming, it's quite, um, it's significantly, like, it, it's there since a long time. But even in literate programming, there was always one single narrative, right? And then it was intertwined with how we are writing code. Um, but then it turns out that when you, when you work with code, the way you read is actually distinct and has distinct needs from when you write, uh, for, from writing. And, and that's interesting um, because it means that we need to have different, um, different experiences for, that are maybe specific to reading and that they don't necessarily have to accommodate writing 
or the other way around. Um, so they don't, we don't have to conflate the two. I guess if you think about, you know, where do people, where do people read code today? Probably in text what editors, maybe on editor, uh, right? Just yeah. think of the, <laughs> think of that name, editor. Yeah, right? yeah. It was meant for editing, and that's what happens when you never talk about something. It's implicit. If it's implicit, it has never been optimized, right? Um, so, and and then you end up doing funny things like reading in something which was specifically designed for editing, and it solved the problem, which was an important problem at the time. But then yep. we forgot to outgrow the problem. Yeah. Um, and, and that's and that's basically what we are doing with Glamour Token now. It's interesting because along the way, right? We 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 notice oh, we need to accommodate narratives, uh, so it's not just simple views, but we need to you know combine those views, in in different, in, in different in different narratives, and so we have this we have implemented this kind of live documents, which are like you can transform anything in the environment as, as being a live document, like for example. It can be a file, like, uh, you know, doing something with a markup language. Um, but it can also, like, a, the class comment is a is a document, too. So that one can hold. Um, that one can hold, a, you know, interesting uh, living um, narratives. And um, and so, and together with the, the whole image, it turns out, wow, we just, this, like, we just are, we were in front of a, a wiki, basically. Like, the whole image is just a wiki. Uh, if you want to look at it like that, um, <clears throat> and that becomes That's interesting. one big graph. <laughs> it, yeah, and then there are all you always have these kinds of mini multiple different perspectives. Now, and that's this led us to then evaluate this idea that well, maybe this is not just for code. Uh, and then of course it's not just for code because we in fact we we spend a long time just working with objects. Um, so most of our energy has been spent over the last decade or so has been spent on just figuring out how do we fundamentally affect how we work with a single object, right? Not with, uh, not with lots of code, it's just like one single object. How do I fundamentally change that? And it started from there, right? And then all of a sudden it says lots of new opportunities because as soon as you can represent something as an object, um, then this idea of multiple development applies to it. And now what is an object, right? It can be anything. Like in Smalltalk, it's very easy to see everything as an object um, because it was like it's a system that was made like that. And in fact, that's the reason you know, people are asking, why are you doing it in Smalltalk? Especially, for example, the Amherst Toolkit today is running only on a desktop um, mm -hmm. today. Um, you know, like why not in JavaScript? Of course, like running it on the web is interesting, but much more interesting is the fact that these ideas were not conceived until now in the other environment. So there must be something that was missing, not in the technology, but in the culture of the technology and or in the affordability of the technology that prevented people from dreaming a system like that before. So the reason we chose Smalltalk is because we would have probably not been able to imagine it in this form. Um, and at this cost in any other environment today. Um, <clears throat> or at least our imagination was not strong enough. So anyway, that's why we started with small talk. But now it's small talk, right? Like, like a method is a code, a class is a code, but so is a comment, so is a file, so is a, an API call, if it, like a, a result of an API. Everything is, a, everything is an object or representable as an object. So as soon as we have gotten this interesting experience of just working with many different views about different objects. Then we started to see that it's actually applicable to all sorts of interesting, like it has all sorts of ripple effects that were not visible at first. And one of them is, as I said, like we, we, just, ima we just found ourselves <laughs> all of a sudden, you know, we took a screenshot of a couple of documents linked together. And then said, wow, that's a wiki. Um, and then it got ex and then it got exciting because like first like in parallel we also worked on another on another on another system which was actually you know um, it's uh, like a decade or so ago fifteen years yeah um, I, I was for example I was working on a on a CMS system which was pretty cool um, and called Peer um, and uh, like the the author is uh, was. Uh, 
a colleague uh, at, the, at the University of Bern, Lucas Rengli. And the, it was this beautiful little uh, CMS that where everything was an object, like the views were objects and the, the, all the commands were objects and you can just play and then do all sorts of interesting. Um, so you can, you know, it, and it was uh, described in a meta language uh, such that you can, with the CMS, you could edit the structure of the CMS itself. Um, and those are kind of interesting uh, things like that. And so when you start combining these pieces together, then all of a sudden you have interest, very new or new abilities that were just otherwise hard to imagine. Um, we didn't see those upfront. We just started with a principle and then we just, there were like just domino pieces that fall, fell from it. So now, yes, I, I do believe that there's a very interesting intersection between the work we're doing in, you know, in multiple development in everything else uh, related to knowledge. Because now what we have shown is that we can actually change the experience of relating to systems. Um, but at the end of the day, code is just executable knowledge. Um, and there are other pieces of knowledge out there uh, that are maybe not necessarily code or not seen as code but um, to which the same details apply. So for example, if you take a wiki, right? Um, you might want to see, well, let's, you know, the graph of all the links between the pages or whatever, you know, notes you might have in there. But then that's a generic thing. And you can apply this one to any, uh, you can apply this one to any, you know, wiki database anywhere, right? You can just say, they take all the pages and draw all the connections between them. That's like an interesting thing. But what we know from multiple development is that as when I have a visualization or any kind of analysis in browser or whatever, um, and I can apply it to any system, it almost has no value. It has an, it has an entertainment value, but it has little impact on my day-to-day -day activities. Um, instead, we want to create, we see lots of, we see lots of value being created by constructing highly custom made visualizations that uh, come after I have the question as to what exactly is it that I want to learn from my knowledge base. Right, um, it's, a, it's a bit like how everything can be seen as a graph, but if you just try to throw a generic graph visualization at some arbitrary piece of information, it's probably not going to be very informative or it's not going to be the form that you usually want to be working with that information in. Yeah, exactly. Right. And then as soon as, but, but if you, if you start to, if you, if you build a tool that specifically answers your question, so it's this idea that the shape of anything, if the data doesn't have a shape. So that means that anytime I want to look at it, I want, I have to ask myself before I look at the shape, say, is this the kind of shape that I'm interested in? Is this the kind of shape that is useful for my goal? Because that goal, that, that context is, is what makes the whole difference on whether or not a tool is useful. And today we are so used to using, you know, out of the box tools uh, to the point in which we decompose, we very often decompose our activities across tool boundaries. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna do this thing here and I'm gonna move it to these other tools. I'm gonna do something there. I'm going to move into the other tool. But then you have this other problem, which is that the kinds of questions people ask are only those that the tools, um, that the existing tools will be able to provide some sort of answers to. And because or, tools are generic, people will ask generic questions mm -hmm. and they will miss contextual value. And value is always contextual. And, and I think that even when you look at a generic tool and you do think of some questions where it's like, oh, I can, I can see that a thing that I, I, I would want to do here, a way that I would want to express and you can kind of imagine it, but you can't then use the tool as a stepping stone to what that would suggest next. You can't say, let's give it that shape. Let's give it some more specific behaviors. Now, what new questions does that inspire? How do I expand the frontier? Because your frontier is stuck at the generic layer. So you can, you can only see a, a bit beyond that. And exactly. you, your yeah, your brain is doing heavy lifting there. You can't offload any of that to com the computer and, and have a back and forth. That's that's precisely it. That was the that was what we found. Um, and then we found that actually these these 
this affects significantly what we do on at the granularity of a single uh, of a single problem that I might have, like on a single bug, on a every little thing in my development flow is affected by whether or not I'm able to create a view on the problem I'm trying to solve. And it's it it is like all features are completely irrelevant. The only relevant thing is, am I able to mold my right. You know the shape to whatever I'm interested at this moment in time, and then tomorrow or you know in five minutes from now I might need something else, um, and so this is why the environment has to be like that. So, a, a very long answer to your um, initial you know question about um, <laughs> about uh, you know, how how we see the, the the connection between this and. Um, and wikis, we, we do see a very strong overlap there. And we see all the principles that we have learned in, um, in programming as being directly um, applicable to nearby spaces that are seen today as being distinct spaces, but we think they are actually not. <clears throat> so let me give you, maybe I'll show you an example. <clears throat> So here, for example, this is a, um, let's say, I'm gonna take Glamour's Toolkit. And uh, this is the default, the first document we might have. And that's like a live document here. It has an interesting, like a, a wiki syntax here. Uh, and then I can see, okay, look, this one is, um, <clears throat> this is a link. And notice how the markup appears and disappears as I go next to it, which is interesting because, um, right, it's, the affordability of editing is very close by, but it's actually optimized for reading. Um, it's it's like the, the shape that you get. And you know, typical typical instances of markup languages, you'll have you know the edit view uh, type of uh, distinct experiences, which is interesting because it recognizes that editing and reading are two different activities. Um, but um, we think that there's, it's possible to like, this is an in-between the edit view and what you see is what you get uh, type of thing. So this is an editor that allows you to do both. In fact, for this editor alone, um, this was the core principle, the main reason why we've built a whole new graphical stack, just so that we are able to, um, just so that we are able to, to build this kind of an editor. And then for example, here, even though this is like a, looks like a text editor, Right, uh, and there's this thing, and this this picture over here is actually added by the syntax highlighting of this markup. Um, and so, if I remove that and I add it back, then um, it will be added again there. And so, this this picture is actually drawn live by the syntax highlighter <laughs> interpreting this as I'm typing. Um, so, which is okay, like it's an interesting uh, technical ability. But then we say, well, what is here, for example? This, this is actually the, the diagram of dependencies of the parts in, that make Glamorous Toolkit. So, <clears throat> for example, if I take a look at uh, some of these, these are actually clickable. So the, I, I clicked on the inspector component. And now what do I get? I get another document over here. This document even embeds here some uh, an inspector. And it's again, like this, this inspector is added live by a syntax by uh, an annotation. And then from there, I can go and navigate to something else. Um, and I can see different, uh, different extra informations, right? Or here's another one. So what I've just done here is I actually navigate now. Like, this is an IDE, right? And I'm navigating the, the space that makes the IDE, but I'm looking at it as if it's a, as if it's a wiki from yeah. that perspective. Now, what's interesting about this is the question is, oh, what exactly is it? What do we see here, for example, right? And so there's this little, there are these little icons here. Everyone, everything you see is like there's an object behind it. And this object actually happens to be the class. And it's the class and that defines how, um, which, which all the dependencies, right? So it's like a build system, um, the, the build dependencies definition in this class and this class has a comment and the comment is the document hmm. 
And of course, <clears throat> this thing here, this widget here doesn't exist in the document. And the doc it's basically rendered as I look at it based by interpreting this annotation. And so, but then it goes further, right? So if I now switch back and then I look now at code, the code that is behind, like the, the, the comment is just one of the projections and now I'm looking at something else. So for example, here I see, this is small talk code, so fire code. And uh, here I can see, for example, look, this is a baseline that points to a definition of another. So this is a baseline, so Glamour's Toolkit uh, Playground depends on another project, which is called G Toolkit Pager. Now, what's interesting here is that this is a string. But look, there's this little interesting triangle over here. And this little triangle is actually um, a triangle that defines a string. So if I remove something like a letter from the string, the triangle disappeared. Uh, or if I, but I can do, you know, completion in the, in the triangle, in, in the string. And then if I if I complete this and it finds that there's indeed there's another project on like that, then I get a little other triangle over here, which I can then expand to see the corresponding baseline method from a G Toolkit pager project. And then I can go on and, and navigate some more of that. So what's interesting about this is that the, the same thing that we are applying to creating documents, same ideas the same operators, we're now applying to uh, navigate code. But in this case, if we're having a little, a little interesting add-on that I actually realizes, well, I'm in a method called baseline, which is uh, annotated like that in a subclass of baseline of, and I'm actually sending this message baseline with, and so that means that the first argument is gonna, I have to look it up. Mm -hmm. And so the, the editing part is also subject to this moldability issue, like this moldability principle. So we can have very all sorts of interesting operators that are available everywhere we are, be it in, during reading or be it during writing. And so, yeah. But so, yeah, we do see these two spaces as being very, very similar. In fact, we think there's no distinction between them. Um, it's just that the distinction that people have created so far is, is, is artificial, as it happens to be with most other tools. So just to give you an idea here, this is actually a system that we've implemented and um, it, has, um, it has a few um, like documentation. So here I have, for example, I can see the system looks like some sort of a UML diagram over here. Um, but <clears throat> I can also look, take a look at something like this. And this one actually documents not structure, it actually documents business logic. It's actually documents how a restaurant, like a model of how you know, different parts, different actors in a restaurant can communicate with one another. Um, and this is now inside a document, right? But I can also go and interact with things and play with them, right? <laughs> but if I want to, I can also actually go in there and I can click on that one, right? And now I'm inspecting this object that I see there. And I have a full inspector there and I'm playing with this object. And so I'm now, I went back from something that maybe is just consumable by any other non-technical person. And I just quickly go to the technical side of things um, in a seamless environment. So this is also this other idea of and which is also, it's very easy to observe in a system like Smalltalk or maybe like Lisp, um, where the or meta levels are essentially handleable in the same way. It's very easy to go and combine different meta levels, right? So here I'm looking at how something is and, and here I'm looking at the structure of how that something is. Um, so let's just going and jumping. But very often we find that really interesting problems almost always have to navigate different meta levels. And so if you don't have the, if, if your tool will only expose you to a certain set or maybe one or maximum two sets of meta levels, uh, you will find yourself very quickly constrained and you will only be thinking in terms of those, those constraints um, without having you know, freedom of expression from that perspective. 
um, yeah, and then so you can also then you can apply this one to all sorts of other things. So for example, here we have um, you know a, a model for prices um, where you can say, well, you know, if I have 100 euros here and 200 euros there, and I sum them, I get 120 euros. Um, or but yeah, if you know if I have something like 100 euros plus 20 dollars, then I'll be getting 20 dollars plus 100 euros because I don't need to <clears throat> make the conversion yet. Uh, and then of course, like it's more interesting when you look at things like um, discounts. So for example, here I have a hundred euros discounted by 10 euros, which is discounted by 10%, I get 81 euros. So <clears throat> now these are, uh, this little thing here is actually provide, produced by the code that I have above, which is like an example. Uh, or something we call an example, but this example is nothing else but a, um, it's like a test when I'm setting up something and I'm asserting this. So this one is actually just like a test, right? You set up an object and then you're triggering some behavior. Uh, in this case, I, I create an object, I, I create a price, I discount it by 10% and I expect that it has 81 euros. Um, but the difference between examples and tests is that examples return an object. And when I start to combine this return with a view, the custom made view. So this view is actually defined here in this annotation. In this case, so actually let's just uh, remove the specific view. So now I'm actually gonna show the whole full inspector here. So I can now <clears throat> actually take a look at this or that, the different views on what makes an, a price. Um, right, and now I can come, I can do this and I can see how the code is being structured here. And I can see how the objects are being structured, the resulting objects are being structured. All in a live document, which is just a tutorial about how you can, you know, play or comp compose prices and the kinds of operators that are, that are possible. <clears throat> and, um, so what, what is interesting here is the way we have, there's a very interesting link that goes, so it's, it's, it's used to be like this idea of, okay, here, let's have code is over here, this documentation there. And then for example, there's a problem with, oh, how do I, um, it's, it's hard to keep documentation and code in sync, right? We have this problem. And why is this problem there? Well, <clears throat> because we copied the code and paste it here. Well, what if we don't copy the code? <laughs> what if you just pointed the code, uh, right? Then all of a sudden you're saying, well, you know, like the whole thing becomes cheaper, right? Uh, I don't have, yeah. I have much less of a problem with my hand than, than if I copy it. Yeah, yeah, don't repeat um, yourself. <laughs> but, then, but then there is more, because I mean, in this case, I don't just want to copy the code. I want to copy the result of the code, mm -hmm. right? So if you think about, for example, a space, which is like, define as notebooks today. Right? There in notebooks, people put the code there in the notebook only to say, well, what should, the, what should the result be? But then there is no difference between this thing that I put over here and the test. In fact, we created this one for testing purposes. So there's no, this is how we describe tests. Yeah. We describe tests as examples, which means that at the end of the day, if I want to create a narrative about the behavior of my system, I will just take some interesting examples and I will just create a little document and combine them with views and boom, I have, I have documentation, which is very easy to maintain. It's testable because I only have executable pieces. Um, but what's more important is that documentation becomes like a little tiny, it's basically, there's no cost associated with it anymore. You just have, write your tests, write your views, it's profitable. Um, that's what we're showing with multiple development. By the way, at the end of it, you can also put piece those together like a Lego and create an interesting narrative. So, and so is this it, is what I'm saying, yeah. those, the, these spaces are very, very similar. Like, wikis, code, uh, notebooks, they're really, really not that distinct. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love being able to, this idea of being able to look at something, like being able to actually solve the problem of noticing, hey, I'm my documentation has 
uh, is, is going to get out of sync with my code here. What do I do about that? In a generic tool, you don't really have a good alternative there, or you have a very heavyweight alternative. Like I'm going to write some way to generate one from the other, and then I have to run it through the build process or something like that, as opposed to just having them connected live in the, in the same runtime. Is this you modified price here, uh, basically just a price that's remembering a, a trace of computation, like it knows what it was modified from and what operation was uh, performed or like how I see you, that it's, this one over here. Yeah, I see that when it's rendered, it actually uh, knows what operations were performed on it. Like it's rendering the operations as well. Uh, well that's an interesting thing, right? Uh, in fact, so but he, it's the other way around. So uh, the, this is this is one of those hard things to describe. So if you think about, like, can you make, can you, like, when we are, we are, we use this, this actual, this actual thing here, we use it also for, or similar projects like problems like that. We use it with design, in design exercises with, uh, with people. And then we ask, so the first kind of access, like first kind of solutions people will put together will be some computation, you know, like here's a price, there's like a function and you give the function, you know, you give the previous, the input, to, you know, the function is discount by money. You give the actual price and you get back, you know, 90 euros. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you take this result and you give it to the other function, which is by percentage, and then say 10% and then get 81 euros and it works, right? But you will not be able to draw it. And so, but when we are talking with business people, they're actually drawing these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And so then there's an interesting thing, which we are always talking about, wow, there's this gap of communication between technical people and non-technical people. But then we say, well, if you're drawing, right, views like that are very, very interesting because like, I don't have to go and reason about the implementation. I didn't even show you the implementation, but we can still already imagine how it works. Um, but, uh, but the other interesting thing about it is that a picture is, is like, most many people are drawing these pictures by hand, like on a whiteboard or a napkin or on a piece of paper. <clears throat> uh, and the thing about that is that those pictures are nice to have before you have a system. So describing what you want to get, what you want to build, that's an interesting thing because those are wishes. Um, <clears throat> and wishes are, that's what you should, you know, drive your, you know, plans by that. And you want to go and, um, fulfill some sort of a wish. But if you have a system and you're still drawing a picture about that system by hand on a whiteboard, now that's a belief. <laughs> that's what you think the system is. Mm -hmm. And um, many people will base decisions on what the system is based on that representation that is actually just a belief. So to counteract that, you're saying, well, <clears throat> we're not gonna write anything we can, we will be drawing this before we have a system. But as soon as we have a system, we want the system to, pro to, to, to offer these representations for us. So as soon as a human deems a specific presentation is meaningful, then we will be showing the, we, we want the system to show these ones. So indeed, the first thing we started from is this kind of design where you say, take this one, give it to a function, gives another result, give it to another function, gets another result. And it's just fine, it works, um, but we can't draw it. But because we have this, this, you know, we want our design, we want our system to draw this diagram, it now puts pressure on our design. And what we find out is that very often the assertions are gonna stay exactly the same, but we're gonna fundamentally change the design. And so for example, here you, you, you'll have a design which is kind of immutable, right? So the original price is only decorated by a discounted by money, which is done afterwards only decorated by discounted by percentage. And I'm gonna execute it lazily when I want to, but because I know the, the structure of the decorations, I can also draw them. And so <clears throat> there's a very interesting, um, we find that but these visualizations are just not, not just cosmetics, but they actually inform how we should be designing the system, which it's, and it's a, it's a way, it's a way to exercise design that we would have otherwise missed. That, that was one of a surprising lesson we learned. Um, 
So does this address the question or questions or? Yeah, that, yeah, that answers the question, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I, I have the tendency to <clears throat> maybe speak a little bit too long. No, no. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yes, maybe we can move to another subject then. Um, yeah, let's see. So we've talked about wikis. For, well, I guess one thing that's a bit related to this is, um, uh, I, I guess, persistence. Like as you're, um, so when you edit code, um, a common thing to then do is maybe export it to a version control system or something like that. So at least one way that you can persist it. Another way that you can persist it is just saving it in the image. Um, how do you, uh, I mean, first, are there any other um, uh, methods of persistence there that you use that I missed? And, and then I guess second, um, what do you do on the side of um, like editing these uh, the documentation, like wiki objects? Like where, where do they go? Mm -hmm. So this one here specifically, these ones are actually class comments. So mm -hmm. it will be a class called like this. And uh, this is where it, it, uh, it exists. So, uh, so in this case, I'll just be committing this one together with the code. So everything in Glamour's toolkit is actually today stored in GitHub. Uh, so on, on GitHub and is exportable like that. But then equally well, you could have a, um, you could have, a, so let's say if I open here a file system, um, which is nothing but an inspector over the current folder. Um, so there's nothing special about that. Okay, so if, I, if I'm looking at Fincom, let's see, uh, I'm looking at Glamour Toolkit, the actual project that makes for Glamour Toolkit, and I look at the docs, right? Um, mm -hmm. Then I can see, okay, look here, there's a, there's a, <laughs> there's a folder called Beacon and there's a, a file called Pillar. So this mm -hmm. is now I'm browsing the file system. But when I'm inspecting that one, I actually get the same thing. So this is a, the markup and then it's just being interpreted. So uh, the simplest thing is like, you can either put it as a class comment today in Glamour Toolkit, but, mm -hmm. uh, or you just create a file and then you'll have it there. So these are, for two immediate things that exist out of the box. But then with other, <clears throat> other plugins can work with other sources of storage or synchronization mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that might exist um, separately. So it could be just as well a database. There's a distinction mm -hmm. between what we see, right? And then what, and what we store, but there's no limitation whatsoever to the fact that uh, Smalltalk or like, Glamour toolkit because being a small talk system is saved as an image. What do you, as you're working, um, do you just uh, frequently save the image or something like that to sort of keep your work no. saved? And then, no, we usually um, we don't save a lot. The images, images yeah. are you know something that uh, are just work work artifacts. So yeah, I guess I'm thinking commit the code and then build it again. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking like as you're, uh, so do you, like say that you work for five minutes and then you don't want to lose your work. Um, do you just commit very frequently commit. or? Yeah. yeah, okay. But sometimes you want to say, let's say maybe you did, a, you took some data and then it took a long time to, to get it. Yeah. Uh, then I'm going to save the image is the simplest thing to preserve that one. So you're going to play with this. You have two options, either save the image um, and then you're going to store everything in that image exactly in the form it is, or you externalize the code. Like mm -hmm. whenever it comes to code, we're not going to persist the code in the image. Mm -hmm. uh, the image is a result of code. It, it's not the form of persistence. Right. Yeah, I'm mostly thinking here of just um, uh, protecting against... Uh, you know, a crash or something like that, where yeah, but, you've got some uh, so un unsaved work. Every 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 time you have a crash, uh, you, like the, none of the code is going to be lost. Uh, so changes are are automatically uh, serialized by the underlying firewall. Um, all code that you have in a in a playground is going to be serialized. And, when does um, this uh, serialization happen? Like as you type or um, as you save or. Whenever you say, okay. yeah, so for example, if I say here yeah. one plus forty one, right, and I execute this, um, and I'm gonna now, if I now look at, 
the file system. And I go in there, there's going to be a para local over here, xdocs. And <clears throat> if I look at those somewhere in there, uh, what date is today? It's this one. That's exactly the thing that I just looked at. Okay, and it, you saved the image to cause this file to be written, or it was no, automatically I, written? No, I or? just executed as soon as I executed oh, this piece of code. So whenever code, you execute the code, it's persisted? For the playground. Um, for the and, playgrounds, and, yeah. And every time you compile a method, for example, that okay. change is going to be saved. It's going to be saved. Okay. Other questions? Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, uh, yeah, I guess one thing could just be uh, like uh, keyboard navigation and things like that. So how how um, how keyboard shortcuts uh, work and um, and sort of what what, what they're attached to, to just that that general subsystem, I guess. So <clears throat> everything in everything in um, here, as I said, we've built the whole graphical stack. And it has this graphical stack has this property of being rendered as a single as a single tree, mm -hmm. uh, and that's it. There is nothing else. Like there's nothing in this on this scene that requires any other abstraction. So <clears throat> this this comes from this idea of uh, of uh, morphic, um, which dates goes back all the way to self. So it's this idea of composing a complete scene or everything in here. Everything in this window is made out of the same kind of elements that are just composed in many ways. So a single DOM. Um, so if I now want to find out what kind of shortcuts are available here, right, in this little um, editor over here, I'm now going to use a, I just pressed Control Option Shift or Control Alt Shift. And now I can go and inspect this. You can think of it like a, you know, like inspect widget in your, you know, web browser. Mm -hmm. So when I click on that, I actually see, you know, where uh, in the element am I am, right? So mm -hmm. um, I can see this one. Then I can, for example, here I have a source coder editor element. Now, mm -hmm. let's say that I'm interested to find out more, right? And so now that's interesting, right? Because we just we were talking about what do I do with the tool, and now we're going to talk about how is the tool doing what I am actually, what is supporting right. the way I'm looking at it? So how do I go and find out that one? And that's that's an interesting thing. So very often you will find that environments will offer you specialized tools just so that you can go and find this because it's like it looks like a new kind of problem. But now yeah, if I want to find about anything about my object, this is an object, right? So if I now double click here, I actually get what? Well, I get an inspector because there's nothing special about this. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's an inspector, actually you see one over here. And it's interesting because this inspector, this is an element and it has one view, which is called shortcuts. Mm -hmm. So now I see all the shortcuts that are available there. And what's more interesting is that um, we can, uh, and if I say something like do it, oh. mm -hmm. right. um, like these kinds of actions over here, they even can point me to the place in the code, which is responsible for, for that action, hmm. right? So I just traversed two, two levels of meta. So which are the actions? Where is it being defined? Hmm. And just by concatenating a couple of, a couple of panes, right? Uh, a couple of objects and through a couple of views. And so we just, we just learned to answer that question. Cool. So, so you were originally here, you were on the cursor element. If I didn't know to look in the coder in particular, I guess well, uh, I might just write something to walk up the tree and look for the shortcuts or? Shortcut, look for the shortcuts, exactly. Now, okay, let's find out how do we look for the shortcuts? Because that's another question, right? That we might have. So if I'm gonna walk up that tree and ask the elements about the shortcuts, right. how do I know what shortcuts are there? So let's see if I have here the shortcuts view and I can, I now alt click on this one. I, I, I will alt click on the shortcuts view and I will get here 
the I will get the method that implements the shortcuts view. And I can see, look, this is a column list. You can see two columns, name and combination. Mm -hmm. And the items of that list are is something that I can say self shortcuts. Okay. So if I'm going, <laughs> if I'm now going here, right? And I say self shortcuts. So this is an object playground now, mm -hmm. uh, which means self is gonna be this editor. Right. And I'm executing that. I'm gonna get this list of objects. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing. When we're doing, yeah. when you're in a moldable environment, the views that others have created, they describe because some other human has deemed this as an interesting view, like it solves some sort of problem, it serves some sort of purpose, then I can also use it to reverse engineer the entry points. Like what are the interesting entry points into an object or a set of objects? Mm -hmm. um, and that's an interesting, that's usually a difficult problem, especially if you have a large API and it's mm -hmm. hard to, figure, to, to find your way, right? Um, it turns out that by just building these kinds of views over and over, um, you kind of also help guide those types of problems. Yeah, it's a bit like learning an API from the tests, except unlike the tests, which are ultimately written to show correctness, the views actually were written to directly use the, the uh, uh, the objects to express them in some interesting way. Precisely. Yeah. I like that. So, what do you think? Um, yeah, it looks great. I uh, yeah, I want to I want to dive in. Yeah, you wanted to ask something, I think. Um, I I guess I had one last question, um, which was, sure. yeah, I think that there's. There's not there's not time to get into any of this stuff about um, you know uh, optional typing or transpilation or whatever. But um, a sort of self-contained question I think is what um, what performance is generally like. I guess um, a bit related to that might be like what the concurrency model is and um, what sorts of techniques there are for say like finding memory leaks or just like what what sorts of things in general are kind of like oh watch out here you you know <laughs> create a you know uh 10 million objects and you might you might notice some slowdown or this is no problem because they'll they'll be quickly garbage collected once you drop them uh yeah th those sorts of things like any any kind of uh capsule wisdom about performance in the system well yeah so um so as I said, this is a fire system. So a small talk system, fire system. Um, fire is a small talk system. Um, and uh, it's at present time, it's running on a single processor. Um, and uh, it's just like, it will have a garbage collection that will just work with this. And so you can do as much as you can do with a single processor, or you would expect to do with a single processor. But now, of course, <clears throat> we're we're actually already having uh, the infrastructure in place for um, a sync, async, um, you know, code execution that happens in other uh, images that we can spawn, um, and that's definitely how a good deal of the work is going to move I towards. See. I see. That sounds um, a little bit like uh, web workers uh, on the pretty much on the web. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's kind of there's nothing special uh, from that perspective in, in the system. Okay. Now, when it comes to when it comes to um, you know a, a good deal of because like the the as I said like the the graphic building a graphical stack is reasonably ambitious, especially if we started from a completely empty canvas, mm -hmm. and um, shooting and having this ability to have a single rendering tree for everything, including visualizations. Um, is is was a big challenge, uh, or at least for us. Uh, or we don't know of any other system that is doing that today to the extent that we're doing it. So it's reasonably difficult problem. And uh, <clears throat> but uh, and then of course not to. So over the last maybe six months, five months, we've improved the, the performance with more than ten x. Um, and we've done it by actually, you know, employing the same types of tools or the same types of techniques that we are, you know, teaching uh, at all levels of abstractions. So, for example, here we have um, different kinds of tools. So we have this monitor uh, system. Mm -hmm. okay. 
and uh, it looks like there's a there's a uh, there's a strong this that might be uh, this is not a, a problem, um, but here we would we would get a source of a source of le memory leaks is when we have different kinds of announcers like this. The announcer framework is about uh, notifying basically like in you you have an observer pattern and you want to notify others, and so when when people are look, hanging on to your reference, um, this might actually lead to memory leaks. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then you we get we would get here a list of, of those kinds of problems if we would see it. But sometimes we have um, I'm going to share now another um, another window. So <clears throat> this is now a profiler, and I'm going to now just go and start profiling another um, some like the main window. And I'm just scrolling through the main window. So now when I look back at this, I will see uh, some, uh, I, basically here we're seeing them, we see a profiling not based on me method calls, right? So not on execution calls, we also have those, but um, here we're seeing a very specialized profiler per frame. So you're actually seeing the rendering frames here, mm -hmm. and all those. <laughs> this one, for example, with red, is um, was a frame that took more than 16 seconds, uh, mm -hmm. 16 milliseconds, because we want to reach 60 frames per second. So the the, the cut line for red and blue is 16 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So now, if I click on this one, <clears throat> I'll be getting um, a much more uh, detailed view here of the the kinds of things that actually took a long time. Right. And this is, these are the types of things that actually we use to, to, to judge our performance. And again, like especially in, in, a, in a system that is very, very open um, and like anybody can do anything. If you don't have these types of tools, then uh, very quickly, it just, uh, this um, especially performance can be significantly impacted. So <clears throat> this is how we're approaching those problems. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have we have accumulated a, a good number of tools now that allow us to navigate uh, the, the space. We're still learning though, and I'm, I'm still expecting to to be adding a couple more. But uh, that's how we operate. We take for every single problem. Um, as soon as whenever we do not, we are not able to comfortably address it. We're going to build the tool. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. So you, you should just expect to see lots and lots of tools in our environment. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Uh, this is really informative. Well, thank you for your interest. And um, yeah, I hope to continue the conversation. Um, yeah. let's, let's continue on Discord. And yeah, I'll see you on Discord. Yeah, it looks really cool. Yeah. <laughs> and I invite everybody else that is what they are that's watching today. Um, Join us on Discord, go to gtoolkit.com. Um, and on the contact page, you will find the link to Discord. Uh, and let's continue the conversation there. Thank you very much. Bye.